Right, so welcome back. Uh, Sherman is here and down now. What we'll do is quickly have a good look over the plane now, inside the cockpit and um, outside the plane. Let's have a look outside. Your APU is still on, Sherman. It's making a racket. No, my plane is completely dead. Oh, maybe it's... it might be yours that's making the noise. Roger, or it might be the carrier, the steam catapult or something. Right, so let's have a look at this bird, Sherman. The first thing I notice is that the wings are like two-thirds of the way back. Can you agree with that? Probably more than yes. two-thirds of the way back. Why? Uh, probably just facing the centre of lift and centre of mass together to allow for the ridiculously high angle of attack this thing is known for. Yeah, and we've had a bit of a play about so far, just warming up, and it really does pitch back violently when you want to pitch back, even at really low speeds, almost like vector thrust. It's, um, uh, caveat to that, it will only do that when you're fairly lightly loaded. If you're sending this thing up and loaded up on all pylons, you will not get that ridiculous angle of attack unless you go so slow that you will go into a spin. Okay, firm, and I've done that a few times already. One, another thing to notice that we'll probably experience at some point, when you're all using that, that pitch, that R pitch, like when you're going into the head of a loop or something, it will happily let you stall this aircraft. The F-15, for instance, and the flanker, it doesn't really let you stall it. Fly-by-wire keeps good tabs on what you're doing, at least in our FC-3 versions. With this, however, it gives you full control, and if you want to stall it out of the sky, it's quite happy to let you. That's one thing I noticed. So um, I found that quite interesting. So uh, it's going to be a bit of a widow maker at the beginning, I think. Um, I, you watch those words, because I bet I'm right. Um, next thing I noticed, the boards at the front, the wing leading egg, uh, leading edge wing roots. I can't point at them. I don't have a pointer, but do you know what I mean? The uh, the leading edge extension. Yeah, yeah. those gloves. Absolutely massive. Um, what's that all about? Extra lift. Uh, again, it helps helps with extra lift at uh, weird angles of attack. Roger. Well, again, one thing I noticed when you're pulling G's at certain speed, you get massive kind of uh, white vortex condensation trails along those um, along those leading edge extensions. Looks really yeah. cool. Essentially, if you're moving slow enough and putting enough G-force into a certain area, all the air literally condenses back into liquid form due to the pressure. Awesome. So I look forward to showing that off later. The landing gear, they're kind of like dog leg design. They're a bit weird. I don't know what to think about them. I guess they're meant to so, be tough. Sort of. All carrier aircraft have particularly tough landing gear. This one is designed in such a way that it actually folds back in, uh -huh. which is curious to be why they've gone with this odd dog-legged approach in that it not only pushes straight down, but it can fold in. Roger. Okay, I look forward to looking at that. Flaps absolutely ginormous. I've never seen such big flap to wing area ratio. That's uh, because these are more than just flaps. Partly they are also flapperons, which means they also substitute the role of the aileron. They remind me of the Harrier flaps, you know, those absolutely massive flaps they have. Yeah, that is not meant for VTOL. That's a big wing airfoil, look at that. Ginormous. Okay, yeah, so we, I can the, probably fly really slow, I reckon. Yes, well, at least with a light load. Oh, On this yeah. topic of the control surfaces, You'll also notice that you've got fairly large elevators, or rather elevons, because they are also used as ailerons. Roger that, yep. The leading edge slats, massive leading edge slats. Um, the hook, it's got the hook obviously, because it is a uh, naval plane. I'm guessing that's just a big solid lump of aluminium or something like that. It is. Uh, it's a fairly solid piece of metal. However, there have been footages of LSO landings where one has literally snapped off. Roger that. I wonder how strong. And that connects to kind of a down downward spar, uh, kind of ventral spar. That must tie right into the main chassis then. And um, pretty much designed to be as strong as possible because it has to take anywhere up to 30 tons of force. Mm, I wonder how much. Um, I wonder how many goes you can do on that hook before the whole. The whole chassis has to be written off. Like the Tomcats, if you remember, they could do X amount of landings and then they have to bite the chassis off, so you got the airframe off because of the stress fractures and what are not, not the weakening. Uh, same the real life hornets are also starting to suffer the same issues. Roger. I noticed the tail read? fins are anhedral or dihedral, I forget what it is, but they're tilted to the side. I, I doubt that's still, so I wonder what it is. 
Um, it allows the carrier. Allow for control at a, a high angles of attack. Control at high angles of attack. I, I can understand that because it deviates outside the body, so it might be able to catch the airstream a bit better, so I understand that. Yes, they also act as impromptu air, air brakes when using flaps down. Oh uh, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, roger that. Uh, whopping great big nose. Um, regards radar, what is it, an F-15 radar or something standalone? It's it's an APG-67, I believe, which is the successor radar from the APG-63, which is rather poorly modelled in Flaming Cliffs 3's F-15. Roger that. So it's it's better, we think it's better than an F-15 radar? Um, sorry, it's either an APG-67 or an APG-70, I don't remember which, but it should be a superior variant to the one in Flaming Clips 3 for a, for a variety of reasons. Roger, okay, let's have a look at the intakes. The intakes are always important. Uh, first of all, they're set back over 50%, no, about 50% down the length, so that's pretty far back uh, to the it's, uh, side. The radar is a yeah. huge uh, APG-70. Ah, so it is the 70. Anyway. Roger, I mean, nobody... Yeah, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. So there's a reason they're set back that far. Have you noticed the where the gun is? I'm looking for it, and I haven't found it yet. Uh, okay, look at it. the nose, at the part where there's a little... A tiny little knob sticking out in a little entry point. Are we talking where the on, nose, on top? On or? the front. Yeah, top of the nose. Roger. <laughs> Do you see the five grey slats pointing out of the nose? Yes, those five things. Okay, look down from there, you should see something sticking out. Yes, yeah, uh, that's it, is it? Yes, that oh, is Oh, I see it. Hole. I see the barrel. I had absolutely no idea it was there. Yeah, so if you notice how the leading edge extension is shaped and the position of the gun barrel, the idea is that most of the gun barrel smoke will be pushed over um, the top of the leading edge extension and thus will avoid being sucked into the intakes. It's kind of like the thing, in fact it's the exact same problem that the F5 had in many respects and it has um, gun doors hidden inside of the nose just like the F5 does. Wow, I can't wait to test that out. Okay, that's interesting. Another, Go ahead. Yeah, another thing you'll note about the intakes, um, they are fixed intakes, there's yeah. no variable geometry. I just noticed that, no ramps. limits this plane. It, no, it limits the plane to um, sub Mach 2 speeds. Yeah, right, so if you want some more information on that, we have a video on intakes, a variable geometry intake. Um, it's in the video we did about how a jet engine works and um, about how if you want to go Mark 2 or near Mark 2, you have to have a variable geometry intake to be able to, to uh, slow that air down fast enough. Another thing, Sean, we look slightly ahead of the intake, the boundary layer the boundary layer plate is spaced very far away from the fuselage, like a good foot, or maybe 10 inches, and it very extends a long way in front of the intake. Interesting design feature. I haven't seen a boundary layer plate that big since the F4 Phantom. I wonder if um, oh, someone will probably have boundary layer there. plate. I'm not following you here. So um, if you come out of the front of the intake, yeah, and you yeah. come forward 10 feet, you'll see that there's a plate, a flat plate, that sits against the fuselage, but it's offset by about 10 inches. Oh, yes. It's called a boundary layer plate, and uh, all planes have to have them. You'll see it on the Mirage, you'll see it on everything. Apart from things like the F-15, where there's no, it's not rubbed up against the fuselage. And it's something to do with the fuselage accepting air, and you have to make create a boundary layer. And I just noticed they're really big, and I wondered why. Yeah, so there's a reason for that because the boundary layer in this case actually doubles up as a means of compensating for the lack of uh, variable intakes. That uh, boundary layer, you can see, there's actually that boundary layer actually extends to holes in the top of the fuselage. So if you look up from the back, you can actually see the bottom of the deck. If you look through the holes on either side. The reason oh, for yeah. that is it, create, it creates a wind flow which slightly decreases the air intake speed coming towards the engines. So it has a lesser but similar oh. effect to variable geometry. I've just seen it, Sherman. Right. You can see through the deck. How weird. Yeah. Essentially, that airflow gets distorted and thus slows it down, thus having a similar effect to variable geometry, although not as efficient. That is really interesting. Okay. I can't move my surfaces at the moment because my APU and engine's off, so we won't do that yet. 
Uh, engines look mid-size, relatively low bypass ratio turbo fan, I'm guessing. I'm guessing General yes. Electric. I might be. Any ideas, anyone? Uh, um, let me look this up. I don't remember the exact designation, but these are definitely General Electrics. I'm going to guess about 20,000 pounds of thrust. The, but uh, General I'm Electric F404s. F404s. Uh, F404 G402. It produces. It's the same engine they use in the Griffin. Yeah, That's except the Griffin only has one of them. Okay, so they're not that powerful, so we'll have to find out the thrust to weight ratio, but it might not be that high because these engines aren't that high. We'll have... loaded. Roger. Okay, so it's not that bad. I mean, it's less than an F-15 or something, but it's not... Okay, um, whopping great swept back um, all-moving elevons we've got here, but the looks of it. Real big mm -hmm. mothers. That must give a huge, uh, a huge torque of uh, pitch, uh, a real good push of pitch. They can, but the flight control system will prevent you from overdoing it, so you, you won't snap you, your plane. They remind me of MiG-29 ones that really pitch back high like that. Um, mm. That's interesting. Okay, what big I was going to say is it's a bit more like the SU-33, except the SU-33 allows you to kill yourself by doing that. Roger. Okay, so we've been through the control surfaces, looked at the engines, intakes, got the gun, got the radar. Now I guess, um, let's go and have a look inside, Sherman. Yeah. Right, now we're not going to go through every single button like we do because it's pointless doing any proper, um, you know, technical manual type videos until we get the final product as such. So we're just going to have a little look round. So on the left side where the thrust lever stick is, all of that is very Harrier to me. I know I keep saying that, it just it really reminds me of the Harrier this thing for some reason. Likely because the US put in all of their avionics that they were using to build both the F-18 and the Harrier at roughly the same time, so a lot of it was shared. Roger. And then I've got, if we go up slightly to the front left where the gear lever is, you've got the, or the, you've got the flaps exactly the same place as the Harrier and the various stuff up there. Jetson, some kind of jettison switch there. What's that big bar? Can it be jettison? Yeah. Push to a jet, looks like a mast, mast j arms jettison there. Mm -hmm. That's an emergency, Jefferson. We look in the middle, we've got a nice UFC, I'm guessing that is. Um, yes. Same basic function as on the Harrier. On the right of the UFC, those little uh, green rectangles, what are those displays for? I'm guessing like um, countermeasures and missile detect launch detection, that kind of thing, do you reckon? You mean on the right side of the UFC? Roger. So the way it works is the UFC in the F-18 is a subsystem. Um, so if you click on one of your displays and you click the UFC button, you'll come up with a set of sub-options on the UFC that you can set. Or alternatively, you can press one of the buttons on the bottom part of the uh, UFC, and some of them, like the autopilot, will bring up a list of commands that will do different things right. depending on how you got it. The input. I got it. And this is very A10C to me. Autopilot, IFF, TAC and ILS, DL beacon, data link, uh, and off. So that's interesting. Uh, right, so we've got three MFDs, one on the left, very A10, very Harrier. One on the right, very A10, very Harrier. I'm guessing they do the same thing. Would you, would you agree with that? Those, do you know what I mean? Uh, so you can share. Sort of. their, their functionality is near identical. The two on the top are both what are known as DDIs, and the yeah. bottom one is an MFCD or something to that effect. What's the difference? A uh, minor difference in performance, so the one on the bottom is meant primarily for use with uh, the navigation page and if you try and put that page on both of the top MFCDs together it won't allow you to do that, whereas you can have it on the bottom at all times and on one of the top MFCDs. Roger, okay, it looks very interesting. Uh, below the right M uh, below the right below the right MFCD, a bunch of scene gauges, so that's all good there. Uh, oh, there's your RWR. I've found that under the right MFCD. That's good. Yes. You can probably have uh, it on digital, though, I imagine, on the screen. Yes, you can bring up an early warning page. Okay, so far, everything screams simple to me. Everything looks simple compared to planes we've flown before. So I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> under the left MFCD, it's kind of like a. I've never seen anything like it. All that red stuff. You, you see what I mean? Yeah, the IFE, the Integrated Fuel Engine Indicator. This basically tells you all the information you need about your engines, your fuel, and your time. Roger. Okay, that's fine. On the left, Master Jetson, exactly the same as Harrier. Air to air, air to ground, same as Harrier. Fire, blah, 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 blah. HUD, which will no doubt have uh, probably 
Harrier and A10C uh, bits in, I imagine, would be similarities. Now we look on the right, we've got a whopping great handle. What is that? It is a resting hook handle. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that. Uh, yes, just below that you'll see there's a black lever. We hold your wing folding lever. Wing? Oh my goodness, really? Right. Yes. That's shit crazy. I didn't know we could do that. Okay, good. Um, we've got brightness knobs and stuff on the right, more Harrier type S. Some radar commands down here, probably uh, uh, looks like jamming equipment down here. So, okay. We'll do a proper video of that in a couple of weeks when we get the final, well, as nearer to the final product as we're going to get for a while. Okay, so that... Uh, Kat, would you like to know the total thrust and thrust to weight for the F-18? Yes, please. Oh, the hang on, let's look at... Oh, wait. What, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Chaos, I'm listening. Alright, so the F-15 has the Pratt and Whitney F-100, while the F-18 has the F-404. So the total thrust on the 15 is 133.4 kilonewtons, and the F-18 is 94.4 kilonewtons. Mm -hmm. And a total thrust weight ratio for the airplane on the 15 is 0 0.67 and the 18 is 0 0.38. Say the two last numbers again. Uh, the two last numbers mm -hmm. for the F-15, it's 0 0.67. Yeah. And for the 18, it's 0 0.38. That's nearly half. Wait, tip. Yeah. Payoff, is that, is that for max takeoff weight? That's the thrust to airplane weight ratio. That's dubious. Is that, is that a max takeoff or what? I'm guessing it's wiki, so it doesn't specify. No, it's I'm not wiki. wiki. It's actually from the NASA website. Um, right, Shemmers, we've done that. Uh, right, so that concludes look a rough look at the cockpit and the outside. Uh, I guess the next thing we do, Sherman, is cold start. So stand by for that. We'll make that another video.